Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In this brief video, I'm just going to build on what we talked about in the previous lecture. So that was how we can compute the length of a curve, the arc length, using a definite integral. But I'm going to discuss now some of the nuances and the complexities that go into these computations and how we can circumvent some of the problems that might arise. So let's jump right into it and let's take a look at what I'm talking about. So if you remember, when you're calculating these arc lengths, you are always asked to find a derivative. So if we have a, a curve y as a function of x, we're asked to find the derivative of y with respect to x along that curve. And we are required to have this to be continuous. Uh, sorry, that's spelled wrong. Continuous on the closed interval a, b, right? Typically we ask for derivatives to be continuous on an open interval, but in this case, because we have a, uh, we're integrating over the derivative in this case, we have to have continuity right to the endpoints. Now, there are some issues that might arise that cannot be circumvented. For example, if this thing is discontinuous over that interval, uh, then we are completely done. There is no way for us to compute um, the arc length. Although what you could do is if you have a curve which might be defined piecewise and it's piecewise continuous, you could find the length of each one of those pieces by breaking up the curve into the regions where you have smoothness. Okay, so that's not necessarily a big deal, but what if we have a different technicality? Uh, what if we have a technicality where our derivative has a vertical asymptote? Well, one example would be where you have a vertical asymptote and the original function also has a vertical asymptote. That's not good, right? That would be something like one over one over X. That curve is infinitely long as you approach X equal to zero. So the arc length means nothing here if A was equal to zero in this case. But for other cases, maybe such as the square root function, we do have uh, a, a well-defined curve and a well-defined length that we could find. But the issue with this is that at x equal to zero in this case, we would have a derivative that has a vertical asymptote. So the question is, how can we get around this? And the answer to this is to use the inverse function. And this is exactly the same type of procedure that we did when we were looking at uh, volumes of solids of revolution and using the method of slices, where we found sometimes it was advantageous to write x as a function of y as opposed to y as a function of x. So let me give you a general formula here, and then we can uh, put this into practice. Let me show you how we can use this. So we can say the formula for the length uh, of x equal to g of y. So x is a function of y, where y is going to be assumed between C and D. So we have the same sort of idea. We say if G prime is continuous on the interval CD, the length of the curve um, X equal to G of Y from the point, so the X value is given by G of C, the Y value is given by C to the point G of D comma D is given by exactly what you probably expect this to be. C to D square root of one plus the derivative of X with respect to Y now squared DY, which is just the integral from C to D of one plus G prime of Y squared DY. And if you, if you really want to, if you want to rederive this formula, uh, it's actually quite simple, right? We remember that basically all we were doing was sort of discretizing these curves using straight lines. Well, that straight line computation, uh, computation gave us delta X squared plus delta Y squared uh, all under the square root. 
So then we remember that we changed delta y, the change in y using the mean value theorem. So you can do exactly the same thing here. You can classify the change in X in terms of the mean value theorem using the inverse function theorem. So if you say that if G is equal to the inverse of F, this tells us as long as F, uh, the derivative of F is not equal to zero, that G prime is equal to one, uh, yeah, one over, F prime. That's anywhere that F prime is not equal to zero. That's what the inverse function theorem tells us. And so with the mean value theorem, this would tell us that delta X is equal to G prime of some midpoint C times delta Y. And so you can rederive everything that I did in the previous lecture and put everything in terms of Y instead of putting everything in terms of X. Okay, so the, the question is, you know, how does this actually help us? Let me give you uh, a specific example to show you where this subtlety creeps in. So suppose I say find the length of the curve, which will be given by y is equal to the square, uh, sorry, x over two all raised to the two thirds power from x equal to zero to x equal to two. So just like in the previous examples from the previous video, we're immediately given the endpoints. Let's leave them off to the side for now. So I'm gonna write A and B because the bounds are given in terms of X and, and, and we were using A and B to denote bounds in X. We'll come back to this. We'll talk about how they turn into Y once we'd have to do that. But let's first see why exactly we actually have to turn this into y. Well, if we were to proceed like we did in the previous lecture, uh, we, would, we would find the derivative here, bring down the exponent, subtract it by one, and multiply by the derivative of the inside here. So this gives me one third, two over x to the one third. And this is an issue, right? Because this thing is not defined at x equal to zero. So not defined at x equal to zero. So that means that my derivative function is not continuous on the whole interval. And you can see that there's a singularity here, right? There's an asymptote. So this is a problem. The question is, how do we handle this? Well, the way that we're going to handle this is we're going to find the inverse of this and we're gonna write X as a function of Y instead. So write X as a function of Y. So we, the original curve Y is equal to X over two to the two thirds. Let's raise everything to the three halves power. So I get y to the three halves is equal to x over two. And then I can multiply both sides by two. This gives me x as a function of y, which is two y to the three over two. Now we can ask ourselves first, what are the bounds on this thing? Well, we can plug them into the original function. Uh, and we can see that when X is equal to zero, this gives us Y is also equal to zero. When X is equal to two, this gives us that Y is equal to one. So this whole thing together tells us C is equal to zero and D is equal to one. If you need to make a little sketch of this, that doesn't hurt. It might just clarify things a little bit. But now we can ask ourselves, what is the derivative of X with respect to Y now? So we can calculate DX DY. And this is given by two times three over two Y to the one half, which is three Y to the one half. 
And life isn't so bad anymore, right? Because this thing is actually continuous on the whole interval. So this is continuous on the interval zero to one. So that tells us that we can actually apply this definition or this formula at the top here that gives us the arc length of this curve. So let's actually put in everything we know. We get the length is equal to the integral from C to D, zero to one, the square root of one plus the derivative of X with respect to Y squared, three Y to the one half squared DY, which we can simplify that slightly. We get one plus nine Y DY. And now this is very similar to an example we did in the previous video. I believe we had the square root of one plus eight X or something like that. Um, so you can do a substitution if you want here. Uh, this is relatively straightforward to find the antiderivative. We get the one over nine that comes from the substitution and then increase the power of one half the square root by one and divide by that new power. So that's one over the new power one plus nine y to the three over two. And this is all running from zero to one. And you can clean this thing up a little bit. Uh, the numbers, you know, they aren't as pretty as maybe you would like them to be, but this gives you two over 27 and then 10 root 10 minus one. Woohoo, right? It's a number, it's pretty ugly. If, if you really care what the decimal is, it's like 2.27 if you throw it into your calculator. Uh, but nonetheless, this gives us a new way or, or an alternative method to actually um, finding the arc length of curves when all of maybe the prescriptions for our formula are not met.